Hello, good morning. So today we're going to be looking at the horizontal stretching, shifting, compressing of sine and cosine functions. Again, if we're trying to get these things to mimic everything that oscillates in the world, we need to be able to stretch them up and down, shift them up and down, stretch them side to side, and shift them side to side, right? If we're going to get them to fit all the data that we'd want. And we pretty much can. <clears throat> um, for simple things, and then when we get to more complex ones, we combine sine and cosine in more creative ways. But anyway, that's that's beyond calculus. So for these, we want to become comfortable with how do we stretch and compress and shift horizontally, and then we'll summarize all the transformations. Okay, so where these things happen, the horizontal stretching and shifting is inside. And you've seen this with logs, and you've seen this with uh, other functions up to this point and the same things hold um, but sh since it's in the trig and periodic function package we're going to go over specifically the notation so this b right here this is what we call the frequency and how you can kind of think about this is that it is it determines the speed of a period Okay, so if B is greater than 1, this thing starts to oscillate a lot faster. If B is between 0 and 1, just like multiplying by, you know, 0.5, it's shrinking that down, it's slowing it down, you're going to start to see some slower periods. Okay, so the bigger B is, the faster it's going to oscillate, and the smaller it is, closer to 0. It's going to start to slow things out. C is what we call the horizontal shift. So this is how much it shifts to the right C units as long as this is minus and C is positive, just like we saw before. But it has to be in this uh, factored form, since we have both the frequency acting upon the input, right, multiplying it and making it go faster. And then we also have this horizontal shift, which moves or fast forwards the inputs or delays the, uh, the inputs. So it needs to be in this factored form. So we'll see how to uh, get it into this form with an example. But I just wanted to kind of preface, these are the two parameters we'll be playing with here. So to show you first what this uh, B value does, so let's look just first at Y equals sine BX. And just know that this um, corresponds to Y equals cos BX. But we're going to start with sine. Okay. Um, so what is the difference between sine of x, sine of 2x, and sine of 4x. Well, one thing, one way to think about this is that this is, right, this is like the vanilla sine function, right? And it looks like this. It oscillates back and forth over a length of 2 pi radians. And so... If this has a frequency of 2, this really means this multiplier of 2, it says it completes 2 cycles as fast as this completes 1, as the vanilla one completes 1. So instead of completing uh, 1 big cycle, it's completing 2. So it might do something like this in a length of 2 pi. And for this last one, it's saying it's completing four cycles in the same amount of time. Let's say here. And so it's doing something like this. Oops. Has the same amplitude. That hasn't changed. But it's got one, two, three, four cycles in 2 pi. So that's really what this um, 
number corresponds to. This two tells me I've got two cycles, and likewise this imaginary one tells me it's just doing it in one cycle. Okay, so what happens is that we see that the frequency is inversely related to the period. inversely proportional to the period right why does that make sense when I, I just throw out those terms there inversely proportional it means that when one goes up the other goes down right so as the frequency increases what's happening well the length of the period went from 2 pi all right, the period was 2 pi here. What's the period for the second one? 1 pi. And how about for this third one? What's, how long is the period? Well, you take 2 pi and you cut it up into 1, 2, 3, 4 pieces. That's 2 pi over 4 equals pi over 2 is the period. All right, it's completing a cycle in that length. So as these numbers go up, the period's going down. So we say they're inverse, inversely proportional to the period. Inversely is not a word, I'm pretty sure. So how they're related in actuality is that the period is equal to 2 pi over b. How do we see that? Well, the period is normally... 2 pi, right? How did we get from a, a 2 pi to a period of 1 pi for uh, this red one here? What did we divide it by? Well, we divided it by 2, right? That gets me 1 pi. And how about for the last one, pi over 2? How did I get a period of pi over 2? Well, I took 2 pi and I divided it by what? 4. So I chopped it into 4 pieces because that's how fast it's completing a cycle and I get a period of pi over 2. So this works for any period and frequency, any period and if you're giving me this B, um, this is how they're related. And likewise, if you were to manipulate this equation, multiply both sides by B and divide both sides by the period, you would see that B is also equal to 2 pi over the period. So just verify that you know what I mean when I'm saying these two things are equivalent that I got from this to this. So these are how these are related. So given a um, formula or given a graph, we should be able to see both what is the period and now what is the frequency or what is that B value. So a couple examples here, we'll start with this one on the left. So Describe the graph of y equals cos of 3x versus y equals cos of x. So what do we know? We know that this completes a cycle three times faster than y equals cos x, right? So if we were to sketch a graph of them, y equals cos x starts at its max goes to its min oops something like this in a length of 2 pi and cos of 3x does this three times faster so what that means is it's chopped up this interval into three pieces so like here and here it's probably not a good cut something like this here and where would that be? 2 pi over 3 here. Not to scale. Doesn't matter. Because what happens is it oscillates between 1 and negative 1 in this period here. And then does it again. 
and then does it again. Goodness, my amplitudes are all goofed up. These should really be at the same height, right? They're not, um, but they should be. So just imagine that this guy shoots all the way down here. Okay. So it completes its periods three times faster. So it, let's be clear, y equals cos of 3x completes three cycles in the time y equals cos x. And you don't have to use in the time. You could say in the length of interval completes one. Could also say y equals cos 3x oscillates between 1 and negative 1 just like cosine does. But has a period of equals 2 pi over 3 instead of 2 pi. So these are just some of the most surface level differences here. Completes three cycles per one for cosine, and it has a period of 2 pi over 3. Okay, so let's look over here at this example. We're being asked now, given a graph, what is the formula for this function? And it oscillates between 1 and negative 1 here. So we got asked, does this look more like a sine or a cosine function? Well, this starts at its midline and ends at its midline on the cycle. So that looks more like a sine function to me, right? So I'm really looking for something along the lines of sine bx. Um, I put this b in here because I know... The period's been either stretched or shrank. And so we see it completes one cycle in a length of 5 pi over 4. So if I'm trying to get to the formula for this, that means I need to find b. So this 5 pi over 4... equals five pi over four equals two pi over b. All right, since this period should be equal to two pi over whatever the b value is. So now I can just solve this for b. Um, we can cross multiply, right? That would be fine, or just clear the denominators. Multiply both sides by b over 1. We get uh, 5 pi b over 4 equals 2 pi. And then multiply by the reciprocal over here. So we multiply both sides by 4 over 5 pi. We see that the pi's will cancel here. This stuff all cancels. We're left with b equals... 2 times 4, which is 8 over 5. So 8 fifths, or what, uh, 1.6. So that's my B value. So then it's looking like this should be Y equals sine of 1.6X, or 8 fifths X. We should get used to putting things in fractions. We're all adults here. But... Um, what we're not taking into account is that this isn't a, a regular sine function. We we definitely shrank it by increasing b to be 8 fifths x. But what else is different? This started and went to its minimum first and then up to its maximum. So this is really not the sine function like we're used to. That would have looked like this. 
right? What we actually have here is the opposite of that. So we really have negative sine of 8 fifths x because it's reflected over the x-axis, right? So that's this guy, the one that we were given. So just to be on the lookout for that. Now all these different parameters are going to come into play. But before we get there, we want to talk about shifting. We now know what stretching and shrinking does to the graph. We know where that parameter lives. It lives in this B slot. And we know how it relates to the period. It's, in, it's inversely proportional. And we use this equation to be able to go back and forth between these two values, depending on what we have and what we want. So let's look at what happens when we start shifting things. Okay, so what we remember from our shifting and stretching unit is that y equals f of t minus c is just taking the function f of t and shifting it to the right c units. So what ends up happening is you take the input, you subtract off this amount, and what you're really doing is kind of fast forwarding the function into its rule a little bit faster. So now when we're doing that, and we're multiplying it by, oops, and we're multiplying it by some b here. That is multiplying the whole input. And so if we're really kind of fast tracking the input, that b needs to be multiplied by t minus c. So it needs to live in this kind of factored form for us to see that this is really sine of b of t shifted to the right by c units. So these brackets here are really important. And they're not always written like this because this isn't simplified right it's factored so it might be uh, upon us to factor this um, to be able to see what the shift really is um, and the same is true for cosine so i'm going to illustrate this through an example so let's uh, work through a kind of silly example here that i'm just uh, making up so the percentage of students paying attention fluctuates between zero and a hundred percent so after three minutes, 100% of students are paying attention, and then this occurs again after 12 minutes. So we want to come up with a formula for y equals sine b t minus c, or y equals cos b t minus c. Let's just go with sine and pretend like we don't know any better, and say, actually, let's go with cosine. Um, so we'll go with cosine. And we know that it's at its maximum 100% after three minutes. Okay, so since cosine starts at its maximum, really what we're doing is shifting that graph of cosine, which does this. And we're scooching it to the right so that that lines up with the three minute mark, and then it will do something like this going between 100 and 0. So we know that this ranges between 100 and 0, and that the midline must be 50. So I'm just going to give you this, and it's kind of a review from the previous unit, but I'm going to tell you that this must be the case that it's uh, 50 cosine times b t minus c. We don't know what is happening here, and it's shifted up by 50. So you can kind of just act like these two are given, that when it's at its max, it's at 100, and when it's at its min, it's down at zero. But what we're really interested in is, how do we figure out what B and C are? Well, what is B? B is the period over two pi. Nope, it's two pi over the period. Don't know why I said that. Two pi over the period. And so do we know the period? This occurs again after 12 minutes, clues me in that yes, I do know the period. It's two pi over 12 minutes, which then leaves me with pi over six is equal to B. And we know that this has been shifted to the right by three minutes. So this is my C value, horizontal shift. of three tells me that C equals three. So then this formula must be 
y equals 50 cosine. B we said was pi over 6 times t minus 3, all plus 50. And again, the numbers we were really after here were this b value and this 3 value. This represents the shift and then the period. So now the question is, could you go uh, the other way around? Could you see, given a formula, what the shift is, what the period is, what the frequency is? So let me uh, change it up a little bit. So let's mix it all in here. Given this um, sinusoidal function, describe the graph as clearly as possible and we'll include a sketch. And then I think we'll move to Desmos and kind of verify what's happening here um, to kind of put a bow on all these parameters. So we know a few things. We know we've got an A value, a B value, a C value, and a D value. Question is, does this look exactly like the form we're used to up here? What's different? It's not factored, and that turns out to matter a great deal. Because if it's not factored, that means that this B has been distributed. So that the C that looks like it's uh, the horizontal shift is actually not that at all. It's been multiplied by whatever this is. Okay. So let's go over the uh, obvious ones. A equals 300. This tells us that the amplitude is 300. And so this graph ranges from... 15, which is the midline. So y ranges from a maximum of 315 to negative 245. Right? Up from the midline, 300, and down from the midline, 300. That's how it, much it varies from that equilibrium. So that's A and D. We know B is 3, which tells us that the period is what? Well, that's 2 pi over B, which is 2 pi over 3. So this completes a cycle. And a length of 2 pi over 3. And then how about C? Well, again, we have this issue that this isn't factored. So what we can do is rewrite this. 300 sine times. We know B is 3. X minus what gets me um, 3X minus 4 when it's distributed? Well, it's really you have to divide out right, that 3. And so what it would be would be 4 thirds. Right, verify that algebraically. It might be a bit since you've done any meaningful factoring. So 3x minus 4 thirds when you multiply it through gets you 3x minus 4. So really what we've got is this on the inside and we're only able to see it after factoring. Factor to see C. Haha. Ha. And then so we see, okay, that's really four thirds. So that means that we shift the graph to the right by four thirds. And again, it's because it's fast forwarding it by this much, so it's not a moving to the left, it is moving it to the right, even though that's a minus. So it moves it to the right by 4 thirds. It completes a period in 2 pi over 3. It ranges from 315 to negative 245 and it oscillates about 15. This gives us everything we need to know about this sinusoidal function. So I feel like we could draw a graph that would be pretty okay. So let's see, it shifts the graph to the right by 4 thirds. What I'm going to do is I'm going to mark off my y-axis first. Here's my midline myself kind of a that's a terrible line give myself a 
point to work from. We know up here a length of 300 is going to be up to 315, and down here a length of 300 to negative 245. That's my y axis. And on my x axis, we know that we complete a period in a length of 2 pi over 3, but that we've been shifted to the right by 4 thirds. So if here's 1, here's 1 and a third, let's say. So here's 1 and a third. So this is my like kind of starting point for this sine function. And so that maps up to the midline here. And then we've got a period of 2 pi over 3. So it completes one cycle in 2 thirds pi. Well, how big is that? Well, it's like 0. 0.6 times 3, which is 1.8-ish. So again, we're sketching here. We're not trying to do this perfectly. So if we add 1.8 to, um, to 1.3, we'll end up at around 3.1. So its endpoint should be about here. So what is it going to do? It's a sine function and the a value is positive, so it's going to go up to its max first and then down to its min and then back to the midline. So something like this. Right? And then it would continue in that fashion. But noting here, this length of 4 thirds, or 1.33, and then the fact that this length is 2 pi over 3 equals the period. So that's the kind of new combination of parameters that we add into the mix. And an example of, again, it might look like you've got a horizontal shift, but if it's not factored, you don't actually know how much that is. You need to take that C value and divide by B. All right. So just to kind of summarize more formally, for Y equals A sine BX minus C plus D, and the same for the same for cosine. A is the amplitude, B is what we call the frequency. Uh, be aware on the, on the web, there's two major notions of frequency and we're using what's called the angular frequency. So don't get confused if you're out there um, doing research. C is the horizontal shift. And again, note which direction. When it's a minus C like this, it's to the right. And then D is the midline or equilibrium. And with this, this is enough to model anything that has a simple wave pattern. Okay. Um, as a question to you, something to go off and explore, and maybe even bring into the class discussion is, what is the horizontal shift needed? Maybe you already know this. To make the sine sit on top of cosine. So you can play with that either in Desmos or um, algebraically, however you want to attack that. Uh, speaking of Desmos, I said I would bring this problem into it, and I do want to go ahead and do that. So let's let's take a look with a graphing utility how this would play out. Okay, so if we're starting with our vanilla sine function as the template, all right, because it starts at the midline. 
A, B, C, and D are all going to have the effects that we described. So what we've seen if we increase A, it stretches the function out. We know that if we increase B, it shrinks the period. And if we decrease B, right, it makes the period longer if it's between 0 and 1. It's like making the process take forever. C is a horizontal shift, just side to side. D is up and down. So we know that this thing scales between, or ranges between uh, 315 and negative 245. So I'm just going to adjust my window here to give me negative 250 up to uh, 340. My x-axis I'll have go between 0 and, and 10 for now. And then I can start to stretch this thing in the correct way. So getting A up to being 300, our midline was 15. And why is this stretching past? Okay, because I clearly made up the number 245. It's not 245, it should be 285. See, this is why having students around is good. You guys keep me honest. It's 285, right? So that should be I'll go back and make a note of that in the uh, in the video. Negative two eighty-eight to three hundred. There we go. And keep up a max of three fifteen and a minimum of negative two eighty-five. So if I use the calculator to check myself, which I always advise you guys to do, took my own advice, I'd be in better shape. And so what were the other parameters we had? B was not 1, but it was 3. And we see it completes a cycle. Let me set this to 0. It completes a cycle in 2 pi over 3 in length. All right, from 0 to 2.079. But then we shift it to the right by four thirds. So I wonder if this will let me do a fraction. It will. And so now this looks much more like the graph we sketched, right? Going between 315 and negative 285. And then uh, back up and forth, crossing the axes here, et cetera, et cetera. So Again, starting, you can see the uh, original sine function is still kind of in there, right? But we stretched it up and shifted it up so much that you can barely see it anymore. But the, the relationship is still sinusoidal, right? It just has different particulars. And that's really what these A, B, and C, and D mean. So uh, I will leave this graph uh, in the description for you guys to play around with. Happy hunting with these problems. Again, going back and forth between the formulas and the graphs are really the key idea here. And make sure you hit the class discussion with any questions. Have fun. Double check your work.